Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm out here today at the Echo Valley Training Center for Midnight Brutality, where I am going to be running a really cool historic clone of a rifle. This is a clone of a Delta Force rifle from the late 1980s or early 1990s, and this sort of thing is really best known as like the Black Hawk Down style of rifle. Now, this particular gun is on loan to me from the fantastic Augie Kim at TNVC, the Tactical Night Vision Company. TNVC is, in fact, a, the primary sponsor of Midnight Brutality. They stepped up and donated a tremendous amount of awesome stuff for our prize table here. So we have some shooters here at the match who are going home with some awesome multi-thousand dollar uh, pieces of new gear all thanks to TNBC. Uh, the match is also sponsored by Q, who donated some awesome rifles and cans and other parts, by uh, B.E. Myers, who donated a mall and a number of Kiji uh, illuminators, and also by Varsteleka, everyone's favorite Finnish outdoor supply company, who donated a bunch of cool stuff, their merino wool, and a whole lot more. Now, this carbine actually has some, like, the, the laser on this carbine is the most interesting part of it to me. It's also basically uh, unobtainium. Like, if I break this thing, I am well and truly screwed because I will not be able to find a replacement for it. So, um, fundamentally, what we have here is a CAR-15. This is a rifle that Delta, specifically Delta Force, was building and using prior to the adoption of the M4 carbine. So that's why it's not in M4. It still has a carry handle. And Delta decided specifically, most of the time, to go with 14 and a half inch barrels because the gas system that they had for the 14 five inch was the reliable option. In the early days of the CAR-15, the shorter barrels, the 10, 10, 5, 11, 11, 5, that length of barrel was not considered totally reliable by Delta Force. It's one of those things where if you're shooting it in a temperate environment at a reasonably clean range, they're gonna work fine. But Delta was taking these guns into pretty extreme environments, and they couldn't always predict whether it was going to be extreme hot tropics or extreme freezing tundra. And they needed a rifle that would work reliably anywhere. So they were making carbines, but sticking to a relatively long barrel by today's standards. These are also guns that were being procured commercially. Delta wasn't going through standard army procurement to get these things. They were buying them off the commercial market, basically from Colt. So they got a wide variety of different guns. They had some heavy barrels. This one has the government profile with a cut for a grenade launcher on it. Um, some, like, some were actually 16 inch barrels, some were 14 fives. It's a very, very much a non-standard variety. And then the Delta guys were outfitting these guns however they personally wanted. So this is a really cool setup that's based on a number of historical examples. There is in fact a picture of a US uh, trooper basically heading out on Operation Eagle Claw in 1981, which was the attempt to rescue hostages from the Iranian embassy. And he's got one of these lasers. This was introduced just in the early 1980s. It is a, uh, an AN PAQ-4A. It's got this really cool gooseneck sort of mount that clamps into the carry handle here. And then the laser is basically thumb screwed here onto the mount. This is the trigger for the laser. Uh, when you hold it in, it is, it's a momentary on switch, and it is actually a pulsing laser. So it's not a solid laser beam, it is pulsing like this. Now, I don't know exactly why the two theories that I've heard proposed, both of which make sense, one is battery life, and one is also to reduce the duty cycle of the laser. The idea being having it constantly on is a much more demanding task for especially in early and by the way infrared and by the way full power this thing will blow eyeballs out it's kind of a frightening thing to have waving around there are by the way no batteries in it at the moment um, having this pulsing reduces the strain on the laser itself it's not constantly under power so that's probably why it was done it doesn't uh, some of the people who've been seeing it out here think that it makes the shooting harder I don't, I don't find a whole lot of difference, pro or con, from the pulsing, but we'll talk about that once I'm out shooting. Um, in addition to the infrared laser, we have a Surefire 6P flashlight here that has been uh, clutched. Like, all this stuff was... This is how Delta was putting together these rifles. This was before the advent of the modern, like, tactical accessory market that we have today. So this is a one-inch, simple weaver scope ring that's being used to hold a Surefire flashlight. 
it has an infrared uh, cap on it. So, and then it has a pressure switch, duct taped, gaffer taped onto the handguard here. So uh, this will produce an infrared beam. So not visible unless you're wearing night vision goggles. Uh, for regular daytime use, it has an Aimpoint 5000 optic. One of the early, this is like the latest of the early Aimpoints. It is, it's the same company that Aimpoint is today. It's a red dot optic, just like you would expect today, just with a much bigger body. They hadn't uh, miniaturized them to the way that they have today. So I've got a rheostat here for on off. I can turn that on. I don't know if you can see the red dot in there, but it's it's a normal red dot. It's just it's a red dot optic. It does not actually have any night settings because that wasn't a thing yet. It has a, has a very the lowest daytime setting is sort of vaguely usable in night vision. It blooms out a lot, but not not horrendously. Um, Delta guys use uh, a fair number of aim point two thousand or yeah aim point two thousands and three thousands and also 5,000s. So this particular one is a five. Um, let's see, the, oh, the one other item that we have on here is a collar on the back end of the barrel that is specifically set up for an Ops Inc. suppressor. This was a suppressor that actually telescoped back over the muzzle. So the, the can would come out about this far and you'd have baffles out here and you had an expansion chamber that ran along the outside uh, of the barrel on the back end. And it was a way to get more volume in the suppressor without having more overall length. Now, I don't have one of those cans on here uh, for our shooting today, but that's what this collar is. The idea is the can would attach to the flash hider and then this and the, uh, the taper machined on here would stabilize it and set it in exactly the right orientation so that you didn't have anything like baffle strikes. Um, and then of course we have a CAR-15 style collapsing stock simple carry strap. This is the sort of thing that Delta Force was using for um, things like Operation Eagle Claw. They didn't actually quite work out attempt to rescue uh, American hostages. Uh, the, the Delta Force operations in Panama, um, like the one famously Larry Vickers was on. Uh, the Mogadishu raid, Operation Gothic Serpent had rifles like this. And there's no total standard. Like They were all individually custom set up. So, Augie at uh, Tactical Night Vision Company, TNBC, very graciously loaned me the upper here, this is my own SBR lower, uh, loaned me the rifle to shoot in uh, Midnight Brutality. So the question is, like this thing is, is going to be an absolute bomb for a close-in shoot house, how will it perform on longer ranges? Because I don't think it was really designed for longer ranges out in the field. But well, let's go ahead and find out and jump into our first stage of shooting. All right, stage one, what would Yari do? Yari would have us run more. First off, big thanks to Q, Live Q or Die, out of New Hampshire. They were one of our match sponsors and supplied uh, a couple of Honey Badger rifles with suppressors, as well as a bunch of other suppressors for some of our uh, lucky competitors who got those in the random prize draw. Now, here's where, here's where the pain starts. All right, so this, by the way, is filmed with an Opsin, uh, uh, Psyonix Opsin digital night vision camera. Uh, monocular slash camera, and you can see the huge difference that my little Surefire 6P with its infrared uh, lens, uh, lens cover, is making here. I can see that target really easily through the camera, but this is what I'm actually seeing. Uh, it's interesting to me that the Opsin really does a much better job of making use of that limited flashlight power than my PVS 14s do. So you can just barely see that I do have a flashlight on when I turn it on and off there. Um, now the idea here is there are two mini IPSC targets in the one in each corner of the bay. I have to hit each of them twice, which is proving really hard to do. We can also see the pulsing laser there, which is about double the, the size of the target um, in both dimensions. So I've got about four times the area of the target being covered by that flashing laser. And it became like, I didn't think this stage was going to be that hard to get. Um, I ultimately just skipped a couple of these uh, hits to try and, and move through the stage, hoping I'd be able to, to make up hits later on as well. Um, none of this went well. Here I'm trying to find that popper in the middle. Uh, I do, there we go. I do eventually find it. I'm going to take some shots at it. Uh, I don't end up hitting it. This, again, this proved excruciatingly difficult and, uh, frankly, a bit frustrating. So 
Um, yeah, boy, the laser is is great indoors, and it would also be really good for signaling to something like close air support um, because it is a powerful laser. Uh, it does have quite a bit of reach to it. The, the pulsing makes it easy to spot, obviously. But for small targets at 50 yards in the dark, by the way, I should point out that uh, this is early in our night. There is, uh, there is a little bit of cloud cover. There is very little moonlight. And you can see that without my flashlight going, that Opsin camera has a really hard time seeing much of anything. Uh, the dot you see there is um, a glow stick on the back of, I have one on the back of my helmet, one on the front of my equipment, just so that I remain visible as a safety measure. Like, if it weren't for that, you wouldn't see me at 50 yards through this ops in without uh, a light going off. So uh, now this is the second run through. I have to hit all the plates, each of the plates twice again, and then the popper again. Uh, and I do it from a different port in the VTAC. And you can see there I'm, I'm just having a tremendous amount of trouble trying to find the target, figure out exactly where that is. And even when I can see it, the fact that that laser dot is so much larger than the target itself makes it, again, really hard to make hits. Uh, it may seem like the laser is badly zeroed here. You'll see in some of the later stages, it is actually pretty well zeroed. I am actually able to make hits in at least one of these stages, uh, but that didn't prevent it from being very challenging here. Blessedly, uh, my part time is almost out. Uh, that we will stop the bleeding here at 200 seconds, which is uh, yeah, basically about now. So uh, came in just about dead last, 540 seconds in penalties from targets not engaged. Not a great start. Now onto the moving vehicle stage. By the way, if you looked at that performance on stage one and went, holy crap, I want a better illuminator than that and a better laser too, uh, your best option is going to be the B.E. Myers Mall, which is what I am desperately wanting to get for myself now. So we'll get one. We'll do some video on that. That turned out to be the best solution overall at this match. Now, stage two here, we are riding on the back of a Humvee to start. Uh, there are, I'm going to go past three pistol bays that have poppers in them, and I have to drop those poppers. I did a bit better here. If you watched my match, uh, match footage with the fix uh, and my thermal scope, you'll know that I missed every single one of these poppers in that uh, run. Here, I got some of them. I think I got half of them. So there was a hit. Um, it was definitely easier to do here with a semi-auto. Uh, the laser wasn't great, but it did allow me to get a couple of these poppers. Again, close range, moving targets. Um, that's where the laser is is definitely at its at its best. Now, uh, after those three bays, the Humvee comes to a stop. In this case, it was actually a pickup truck. Um, I jump off the Humvee, I hand my rifle to the RO, jump off, re re uh, get my rifle back right there, and then I have to run down towards the end of the range. And there are three shooting positions once again. There's uh, a barrel on each side of the range and a, I believe it's a VTAC in the middle and a double spinner, so four plates on two spinner stocks. And what I have to do is hit each one of those plates once and then move to the next position. And from here, that's what I'm seeing. There is a double spinner there, but once again, my laser dot is substantially larger than the spinner plates that I have to shoot at. And uh, I remember this being quite difficult to do, but frankly, in retrospect, going back and looking at this footage as I'm doing the, the voiceover here, I'm amazed I made any hits on this thing at all. Um, but I did actually manage to make a couple. Um, really, we have the same issues as the first stage, except ramped up a bit because, again, it's quite dark. So the ops in there, when I turn on that flashlight, that's that's a little tiny worthless Surefire 6P with an infrared lens cap on it. Um, and the ops in does an amazing job of utilizing that light. It does a better job than, uh, than my PBS 14s were able to do in this particular environment. But um, I had a hard time seeing the target. I had a hard time getting the, well, figuring out where the laser was on the target. And I ended up uh, 97 out of 102 places with 720 seconds of penalties. It's not getting better yet. Now, stage three, uh, by the way, if you are looking for any other night vision gear, uh, 
TNVC, Tactical Night Vision Company, was our primary match sponsor. Of course, I talked about this at the beginning. They loaned me the gear that I'm using here. They, by the way, did not loan me that gear on, under any auspices that it would be match-winning, fantastic equipment for this sort of engagement. Uh, but they do carry a complete range of night vision goggles, lasers, helmets, accessories, everything you would want uh, for properly kitting yourself out for a match like this. So definitely check them out. Now, stage three is the classic Casarda drill. Uh, hit the target, throw the kettlebell, go to where it lands, hit the target, repeat for about 50 yards of travel. So we have a full-size Ipsic silhouette at 100 yards here. Uh, it is somewhere in the vicinity of where that laser is blinking. I know where it's supposed to be based on the trees, and I figured I'd give it a shot. Uh, we didn't even bother filming this with the ops in, because again, this is in shadows, no moonlight, uh, in the dark, cloud cover, the ops in got us nothing for visibility. And I, I was not able to ever see the target. I didn't make a single hit on it, and I just bailed. I was getting a bit frustrated at this point. So 13-way tie for last place overall. Huzzah. <laughs> uh, fourth stage. This will be a little bit more successful. Thank goodness. Uh, called Mines, this stage is brought to you by Varsteleka. Uh, fantastic outdoor and military equipment out of Finland. They donated a whole bunch of cool merino wool goodies for our competitors. Now, the idea of this stage is to force you to use uh, distance and up-close uh, focus with your night vision. So there are three positions, and each position has three of these anti-tank mines. On the back of each mine is written either closest, middlest, or farthest, and there are three targets. You have to flip the mine over, read what target you're supposed to engage. Uh, I have, I don't know what this malfunction on the rifle was, by the way. Uh, I couldn't see it. I was basically just clearing it by memory and feel, which I do manage to do here, but you know, coming off of those first three stages, this was not the way that I really wanted to start stage four. Now, the way that I had set this up to do is I would, uh, I had my night vision goggles set to infinite focus. I would come up, flip over a mine, crank one of the tubes down to uh, to tight focus so that I could read the, the word on the back of the mine uh, and then go back. Now, I would like to show you that through the night vision as I saw it. But uh, the one of my tubes has a camera, and it was not the tube that I was using to read. So there's nothing for me to show you there. Um, this is what I was seeing for shooting. The closest target was visible enough. It was large enough. That was, I think, a two-thirds size IPSC. Um, I was able to make those hits without too much trouble. Um, I really liked the concept of this stage. There we go, middle target on this one. The middle target was the hardest one for most people because it was a smallish target at 75 or 80 yards, if I remember correctly. Um, but I do manage to hit it. There we go, actually got a hit. This is, this is by far my best performance of the entire match. Uh, so back and forth, um, forcing people to be able to read something up close as well as see targets out at distance. So you can see I'm cranking the focus on one of my nod tubes and then crank it back out, hit the light, and this time I have to engage the middle target. There we go. So the, this stage is actually going remarkably well. Um, it is a little curious to me that this one went better than the first stage because these targets are, are I think one of them's a mini and they're at, a, at definitely a longer range. I think the difference here is that the moon had come out by this point. You can see we have much better visibility through the ops in. I have better visibility through my nods. I'm actually able to see the targets a lot better. Now, that farthest target was still a bridge too far for me. Um, I don't think, let's see, did I manage to make this hit? Did I? Did I? And you can see the target there. The dot's bigger than the target. Yep, and I just, I abandoned that target. I'll just take the penalty so that I can keep moving. Um, and having already shot the close and middle targets at this, this position, I know I'm down to the uh, the farthest one here as well. So there we go. That time I actually did manage to hit it. So this stage uh, went fairly well. And what this all comes down to is, is illumination. Was I able to actually see the targets well enough to get the laser on them? I still had two penalties here. Uh, that was enough to get me bumped up to 39th position in infantry division.
That was unfortunate. It was honestly kind of frustrating. But we have a shoot house stage. Throw the flashbang, kick in the door, go in, shoot targets in rooms in a shoot house at night. And that is going to be the salvation of my scores with this carbine. Except that it wasn't. So the first night I was able to shoot the shoot house with my fix. For this, last night, we had a freak little windstorm. Um, it actually was very windy around here. As you can see, this shoot house is in a 360 degree berm, which is should be protected from the wind. The guys out here, the One Shepherd guys, the guys at Echo Valley, uh, trained extensively with this shoot house. They set it up like three or four times for testing prior to the match. Everything worked great, and we got some freak airburst of wind in here that freaking shredded our shoot house. So, very sadly, we do not have a shoot house stage that I can show you with the carving, which really bums me out because that was going to look awesome. It was going to be my best stage of the match, I'm sure, because, man, I could light it up in there. But sadly, it was not to be. So, All right, I had some conclusions filmed out in the field, but I'm going to redo them here just to save you that awful EM interference on the microphone. Sorry about that. Um, stage five, so stage five wasn't a shoot house any longer. Um, it was run as a separate stage. Uh, so that people could actually have something to shoot, but it was tossed out of the scores. Stage six that came next was the long range stage, which was 150 to 175 meter targets. Um, a long stage. We actually bumped the par time up from 200 seconds to 300 seconds for that one. And on with my thermal scoped fix, that was a fantastically exciting and fun and successful stage for me. And to be totally honest, I was getting a bit tired of dismal complete failure with this carbine, and I just gave up. Um, I didn't even bother to shoot stage six. Uh, just looking at the target engagements and what I'd been able to do for hits up to that point, I knew I wasn't going to be able to see crap out there um, with that surefire flashlight. So, uh, target basically all the targets were going to be the long range target from stage four that I barely managed to hit once, but at double the distance. So. Sorry, that's that's a bit of a cop-out. Um, I know some people, a lot of you guys, enjoy watching me struggle with underperforming kit, and this was probably the most struggling with the most underperforming kit I have done in a very long time. Um, it's good video. It is educational, it's a very interesting experience to have, but by this point in the match I'd already run it once the night before, and after four stages of, of sucking that badly I, I just gave up. So. Um, had I known, it's an interesting question, had I known how badly that carbine would have performed for me, would I still have used it? And the answer is probably not. I think I would have gone for something a little bit more, more modern, at least a better illuminator. That was my big takeaway from running this carbine rig, is that the illuminator was my biggest weak point there. Um, the Surefire 6P is not by today's standard is not a high intensity flashlight at all, and using an infrared filter on it instead of like an actual dedicated infrared bulb and head didn't do me any favors. That was a carbine that, like I said at the beginning, really was set up for kicking doors and clearing rooms, and in my experience at least it completely fell apart once you hit 50 yards and more um, in, in serious dark. It'd be interesting to have been able to go back to stage one later in the night once the moon came out, see if I could do better on uh, on that first stage with better lighting conditions, but we had other stages cycling through, other squads cycling through, and that wasn't an option. So um, if I do it again next year I will definitely go for something with a better illuminator and probably a, well, a better laser as well. There's no need to bring that that vintage, uh, very collectible laser. By the way, thank you again, Augie at TNVC, for loaning me that piece of basically irreplaceable kit. Um, I'll go for something a little more modern. Frankly, a B.E. Myers Mall is, uh, from watching three nights of people competing out there with a wide variety of kit, that mall is the creme de la creme of, uh, of active IR laser illuminators that I was able to see. So we'll have some video on that specifically, like I think I already said. but. Um, those are all my takeaways. If you didn't see my run with a thermal scope on a bolt action fix, that was also a very interesting one that I did a whole lot better on. Um, we had a great time out there. Uh, it was a lot of fun. The stages were uh, varied and challenging, 
and uh, just in this case a little too challenging for me. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, enjoyed watching me just collapse and completely fail. <laughs> uh, thanks for watching.